Hello, I was born Cheryl Williams, <laughs> and I grew up in a home that I didn't have, I had parents who were religious, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And that is why I want to tell my story. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I'm not telling my story to shock or to make you feel bad or feel sorry for me. That's not what I, the intention of my book on my way home that will be out pretty soon. I want to tell you what Jesus has done for me and not what Satan has done to me. And if I can reach one person with my story and that saves their life and brings them to heaven, then it's worth all the pain and suffering that I had. Now, I started out being molested by my uncle who was 22, he was married, had two children. And uh, when I was, uh, I kept wetting the bed and I was beginning to go to school, I was getting ready for school, my first grade. And my grandma and my mom were there. And my grandma said, we're gonna tell everybody in your school that you wet the bed. And I remember just being terrified. I remember the minute I was standing there, I was standing there like that, my mom and grandma were here. And I says, please don't. And they said, well, you keep wetting the bed. Why do you wet the bed every night? And I says, because Howard keeps doing this to me in the bathroom and I'm scared to go to the bathroom. And that's why I, I would wake up and I'd sit on the side of the bed and wet the bed every night for a long time. And so all the shaming in the world didn't stop me. I was terrified to go into that bathroom where Howard would molest me molest me and my mother would allow that man to give me a bath I, I, how how ridiculous even though he's married and with children don't trust anybody but that really tore me apart and my mom started screaming I'm gonna lose the baby because you said that and I, I talked about that earlier in my last video about how I went out back and I put my face in my lap and I begged God to my for my mom not to lose the baby and I knew it was a girl and I wanted a sister so bad. I was almost seven years old when Bobby was born. So she lived, my mom didn't lose her baby, but I tell you, I was so ashamed because my mom said I had acted too sexy. Who, what mother tells a six-year-old they're too sexy? And I remember standing in the pool there in Arlington going, I am sexy. And I was thinking, what does sexy mean? And I was wearing a little yellow jumper that tied up the here. I, I remember the minute I was standing there, it was like yesterday. And then uh, when I was uh, 14 and a half, I was kidnapped. He told my parents I was gonna babysit for his neighbor's family because their two children uh, needed a babysitter so they can go visit their dying son in Sacramento, which is 110 miles away from Grass Valley. But he had no intentions of taking me to watch the people. First he stopped at the bowling alley, and I think that's where he got the drug Rohypnol. That was real popular back in the early 60s. And then he put the drug inside a cherry cola, and I drank it against my better judgment because I had signed a temperance card and even now I feel guilty over that because I made a promise to God that I would not drink caffeine, take drugs, or have sex or do anything. It was the 1960s temperance cards that you sign and I had the Elder Ted Benden, that's Morris Benden's father. And I'm quite proud to have been baptized by somebody like that. and. Uh, so I've always felt guilty and my mom told me if I hadn't have drank that cola I, that I sinned that he wouldn't have drugged me therefore he wouldn't have raped me but I think he would have killed me. he would have murdered me. So he kept me for two nights and he brought me home a very damaged soul and I grappled with that for two weeks because my mom was gone she uh, left went back to Sacramento and then two weeks later, when I told my mom what had happened, once again, she blamed me. Our home was destroyed by the flood there in Loma Linda. 
My mom was at work there at the hospital. She couldn't come home because the bridge was out. But I left the school and I walked home and I couldn't recognize where my home was. There was uh, two feet of sand on the street and my home had been, half of my home had been blown off its foundation. There was some walls standing. My mom blamed that flood on me because of the poster that was on the wall that said groovy. So I had no place to go. And I stayed with several different people. And finally, you know, my grandpa used to say, dead fish and company stink after three days. So I, uh, you know, being a teenager, I wasn't bad. I wasn't out of control. I had a heart for God. And I think this is why the Lord has protected me again and again and spared my life. I should be dead a hundred times over. Um, so I uh, went to that uh, dance hall and Alice Cooper was there and there was a guy that drug, drugged and raped me and I got pregnant. I didn't choose to get pregnant. I was not having relationships with anybody. This was something I did not ask for and I did not want. But I was vulnerable. I was only 17. I just turned 17 in January. In fact, today is my birthday, January 14, and the flood was four weeks after that. So I was heartbroken. I had no place to go, and here I was pregnant, and then I shared with I didn't really have any friends because we moved around. Like I said, I went to so many, I went to, I counted over 20 different schools. So you can't make friends. Every year it was a new school. So I was always lonely. And my mom was always working, always gone, and me taking care of my little sisters who are seven and nine years younger than me. And also my brother is 21 years younger than me. So here I was. 17 and pregnant and uh, I went to Loma Linda Academy and the secretary called me in to talk to me and I was scared and she sat me down and she looked at me from across the desk and she says we're kicking you out of school because you're pregnant and I know you've been friends with my daughter I don't want you to have any contact with my daughter because you're a bad girl. You are just, we just can't handle somebody like you at this school. And I always smelled, smelled like cigarette smoke. They would take me down the hall, go through my locker, right in front of everybody, because Bob smoked. And so I smelled like cigarette smoke. So they thought I was smoking. And then they would harangue me about my school bill not being paid. And then I got all D's and F's. I didn't even make a C. Maybe I made a C in home economics. I don't know. But all D's and F's. And they told me, there's no way you can graduate. Besides, we don't have your transcripts from grade school. And you failed that anyway. So you're out of here. So not one person from Loma Linda Academy did anything for me or my family on the flood, no one. Not one person called me, none of the teachers called me and said, Cheryl, we're sorry you lost your home and you have no place to go. They failed me. And that broke my heart. And if they represent God, does that make me want to be part of their God system, their church? No, that was a real turnoff and I believe a lot of people are experience the same thing. So my mother was so angry that I was pregnant. She drove me to Booth Memorial Hospital from San Diego without saying one word. And she, it was a, Booth Memorial Hospital is, uh, was a nun, a uh, Catholic and the Catholic nuns run it. And so my mom went in to sign me in and I had a half a bag of clothing because remember this is after the flood and there was nothing left. I was three months pregnant. And she didn't say one word. I tried to talk to my mom and she was just so angry that I had gotten pregnant. But 
I didn't choose that. And even if I had chosen that, even if I had a relationship with a boyfriend, a mother needs to accept her child for, for what happened. Because as a child, you don't make good choices. Stuff happens. Our hormones get raging at that age. We lose our head, we don't think. And good girls don't take the pill, is what I thought. Anyway, the secretary's daughter was on the pill, and that's why she didn't get pregnant. And I was really upset because we had, she'd given me a ride to Vespers, and then here she was in the car having sex with her boyfriend. And I'm thinking, her mom's thinking I'm the bad girl? <laughs> and she told me that everybody's on the pill. And she says, I should get on the pill. But I said, no, because I, I didn't have the, I didn't have a relationship. I didn't want to, to go into that. But anyway, so I, here I was, pregnant, and my mom walks in, signs me in. I took my stuff up to my room upstairs. I shared a room with one person, one girl, and I uh, was excited to go out to the car to have my mom come up and see my room that overlooked the courtyard. I went out there, my mom is gone. She drove away. My mom refused to talk to me until I was almost ready to have the baby. I went to a church with a friend and I remember crying and I lied to the people at church. I said my husband was in Vietnam <laughs> or overseas and uh, I wore a little wire for a ring and they were asking me about my husband and I felt really bad for lying. And uh, they were talking about maybe having a baby shower. But I had gone down to San Diego and I begged my folks if I could stay there with them to have the baby. Even though I was supposed to give the baby up, I was told at Booth Memorial Hospital by the nuns that no man would marry me and I'd be on welfare the rest of my life. And no man would love my child. And so I really grappled with that, but I had no one to talk to. Everybody rejected me because I was pregnant. They had no idea I was raped. I mean, how do you tell them I was raped? You know, you know they just automatically assume that you have loose morals. I didn't get to graduate. I didn't get to go to college then like everybody else did. I was three months pregnant, just just had turned three months pregnant. And I was sitting in a kitchen in, in Redlands. I was sitting in a chair and the sun was coming through and I felt a little flutter. And I told my friend, oh my goodness, I felt my baby move. She says, nah, you can't feel it at three months. I said, yes, I felt it move, it twittered. <laughs> I didn't have a baby shower. My mother never gave me one single thing for my baby. I had no baby shower and she, it was just shame. And the things my mom called me, I can't say on camera, it's pretty bad. But she shamed me for being such a bad girl. My family shamed me. My aunts, grandmas, uncles, everybody was so ashamed of me. I didn't have a church system. I didn't have any pastor that would call me and tell me they're sorry. I didn't have, uh, here is Loma Linda, the Mecca of Adventism, the university hospital, the college, the academy, all these people, the Hill Church, the university church, not one person bothered to offer their help except for the Schaefer's, uh, Linda Schaefer's parents, uh, they, they offered me some help. They were good people, true Christians, and I went to church with them in Redlands a few times. But I was ashamed because of my condition. And then over the years, I've uh, heard people say, oh yeah, she had an illegitimate baby. And uh, when I was seven months pregnant, my aunt and uncle, Bob's brother, Art, 
his wife Mary was really kind to me and they would sign me they knew that my mom and Bob were very mean to me and cruel so they were supportive but because I was underage they'd have to sign me out and they and I could only be gone for so many hours so they uh, took me home with them and Bob found out that I was over at their house I was six months pregnant and he pulled up into the yard and he says where's that blankety blank girl Cheryl and he says what he says I'm gonna kill that I'm gonna kick that her belly I'm gonna kill that baby she can't have that baby ruin our lives with a having a illegitimate illegitimate child and Art told Bob he says get out of here leave your daughter alone she she doesn't deserve to be treated this way and he said Cheryl run out the back and he says I'm calling the cops so Art called the police and I didn't see Bob again but he was very very adamant that I not step foot on his property with my illegitimate child and he refused to have anything to do with my illegitimate child and my mother was very cold to my son on his first birthday she never even gave him a birthday card and I remember calling her mommy's your grandson yeah but he's illegitimate and over the years I was working at uh, Portland Adventist Hospital and one of the uh, head guys in in the lab had a daughter who had gotten pregnant and she was at Academy and they found out she was pregnant and they refused to let her graduate with her Academy friends and I tell you that I, that really triggered some nasty feelings within me that how dare they deny her to graduate with her class because she was pregnant and what about you know that there's several kids there that girls there are having sex there's guys there are having sex there's guys there who have raped but they don't get kicked out because they're not pregnant and I told her father, I says, go to bat for your daughter. That's so wrong that they not allow your daughter to get to graduate with her class. And I thought, what a horrible mess that is. And it really hurt her. She left the church and she's gone forever and I don't blame her. I wanna urge others within the church, those who love the Lord, and have the Lord in their heart. I want you to accept this child that is pregnant. Whether they've been married, whether they've been raped, whether it was a one night stand, usually these girls are hurting. They get into this situation because they're hurting. And it's usually they were sexually abused as a child. I remember the story of when Jesus was brought the, the woman, the prostitute, and uh, all these men were making all these accusations against the one woman. And I think I read somewhere that her uncle had molested her, and that's why she turned to prostitution. I was a sheriff's deputy in my younger years. I graduated from Sheriff's, San Diego Sheriff's Academy. Yeah, I carried a gun. <laughs> I drove a cop's car. I, in those days, I operated the siren and the steering wheel and went to accidents and uh, didn't shoot anybody. And I worked in the prison system too. And I met a lot of prostitutes who are drug addicts. And at first I used to bristle. I used to think, oh, you're just, just scum, you're a drug addict, you're a prostitute, you're gross. And I didn't want to accept them, but then I started hearing their stories. 
So I got to know a lot of these women, these hardcore criminals who stab you in the back. They're hurting. They, the reason they take drugs is because they need to alter that feeling that they have, that ugly, dark feeling of being raped. I chose a different path. I chose not to do drugs or alcohol. I, I've just never had the want to do that. But I could see how others would go down that path is because they don't have anybody to love them. They don't have a system. They don't have a church fellowship that would take them in. Instead, they get shamed. And I think things are a lot different these days, somewhat different, but I still think in their mind, some of the older people, older generation think, they, they think that you have to have this nice big wedding to, to be a good person. Looks can be deceiving. You don't know what's under a person's, what, what's been their past, what's happened to them. Don't judge. Don't judge them for having an illegitimate child. The hardest part for me that I grappled with is I was being pressured to give my child up. And for me, abortion wasn't an option. And I know today, it's easy to get. And I know several who have, and they're just torn. Their lives are just torn. They grapple with that years later. So I didn't want to give my baby away. And they were pressuring me and pressuring me, the nuns there at Lewis Memorial Hospital. But I refused to give my baby up. And I had a dream that my baby was a boy and that God told me to call him Timothy. And I don't know how uh, how true that dream really was. I mean, it was. It, it, to me, it was real. I don't know if it was just a simple dream, but it, I did have a boy. And I decided to keep him and name him Timothy. But my pregnancy went easy until I went into labor. And the doctor that I had was very judgmental and critical towards girls that were unwed and he made their delivery the most difficult delivery they could ever have. I was given an accidental overdose of Pitocin, so my contractions were just strong, and I was screaming out of control. And my mother was head of OB there at the hospital, Grossmont Hospital in San Diego County. And she told me, you're just embarrassing me, and she slapped my face, she stopped screaming. And the pain was just horrendous, and it started Friday night. All the way to Saturday afternoon, I was just having contraction after contraction, and I says, I'm done with this, I'm leaving. And I tried to get out of bed, but I couldn't. <laughs> they tied me, they tied me to the, down to the, in the bed, and they said, you're out of control. But I didn't know how painful it was. I was unprepared. I didn't have any Lamaze classes. I didn't know how to breathe. And then my son was born at 5.01 Saturday afternoon. And I had a very traumatic birth. And that's what's caused my infertility is I got a bad infection afterwards. And I was not giving anything for pain. I did it all natural. And I was exhausted because I'd been up all night. And they took my baby away and they put him in the nursery. And I said, I want to see my baby. And they said, well, we'll bring it to you. And then I, I kept crying, I want to see my baby. I, I didn't hold him. The minute he came out, they whisked him away because they thought that I would give him away. And I. I, be I didn't want to give my baby away. Oh, the, in my dream, God told me to keep my son, and he said, you will never have another baby. And that came true. But like I said, I don't put too much weight on dreams. Um, but that one did come true. And 24 hours later, I still hadn't seen my son. 
and I begged and begged and begged. And they said, well, he's yellow, his bilirubin, he needs to be under the bilirubin lights and we can't take him out. And I said, I want to see my baby. I wanted to, I wanted to hold my baby. I wanted to bond with him and they wouldn't allow me to. Finally, I think, I don't know how many days, it was like two days, they finally brought Tim to me. He was all bundled up. They told me to take a shower and get all cleaned up before they would bring him in. So they brought my baby in and I wanted to see what he looked like. So I started unwrapping him and the nurse, her name was Mary Parton, she came in, she says, what are you doing? I says, I want to see my baby. Put his diaper back on. Are you perverted? I said, oh, this is my baby. No, 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 we got to take him back. So she took my baby away. And uh, I didn't see him for another 24 hours. I was there for five days and I only saw him once or twice. But they thought, and the, then the pediatrician came and he says, uh, you got a precious little tiger there and I'd like to adopt him. I'll give him a good home. Let me adopt your child. You can't do anything for your baby. And I said, no, I want to keep him. And he started putting pressure on me that I was too young. I could go find another family. I could get married and go to college, get married and meet, you know, meet a nice man and live happily ever after and have more babies. But I had that dream so I didn't want to give my child away and I wanted to bond with my baby I loved my child so much I remember one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to hold my baby against me my heart and bond with him and I wanted to breastfeed him and my mom came in she says you're not gonna do that you're gonna be out on a date and your baby's going to be hungry and your milk's going to come through. What are you thinking about? That's just gross. Cheryl, you're not going to you're not going to breastfeed that baby. But I wanted to hold my baby against me. And I think of Jesus when he holds us. I know Jesus doesn't breastfeed us, but I liken that feeling too. That's how Jesus holds me close when I'm hurting. I know it sounds silly and it sounds kind of dramatic, but that is one thing I never got to do. That's a deep pain. And when I think of God loving me, I think of God loving me like I loved my baby and would hold my baby. So that's the way Jesus loves us.